Okay, my name is Bo and I'm an addict. Can everybody hear me? Okay, if I like get dimmed out because I get like in a zone, like wave your hands frantically or something, and I'll try to respond. Uh, I, I sometimes, I've told my story like so many times, you know, so many conventions. And uh, I remember I had a little moment, uh, I think it was yesterday, when I felt a little bit like, uh, oh, good. It works, see? Uh, I felt a little bit like uh, a butterfly that's ready to break out of the cocoon, you know, like, like move to another level, like, you know, get more honest, get more real, blah, blah, blah. And that's, uh, Sharon's, you know, it's one thing, it's kind of scary, like you hear speakers say like, oh, I'm so nervous. The what? Oh, okay. Am I, is he saying to talk louder or softer? Louder? Oh. I've been there before. What happened was I told my story out in Clark Lake, Michigan, and it was outside of these big barns with a field and great big trees around it, oak trees that had been there forever, a hundred-year-old farmhouse like it had a uh, Michigan plaque out in front of the building and no PR system, PA system, public address system. So no microphone, no speakers. Can y'all hear me in the back? And people would go like, oh, they wouldn't even react. You know, they didn't even hear me ask, did you hear me? And, and so I, I started, I went from like speaking about like this to, my eyes born, I'm an addict. For about an hour, and it kind of jazzed up my story, man. So maybe that's what God's doing again, you know. So that's kind of back to what I was saying before. When you told you told your story like a hundred plus times, it gets into degrees, and then you get into a little bit of thinking like, well, I remember I used to like write notes about like what I was going to say and stuff, and I'm not doing that. Well, yeah, it's true. And, uh, and then, well, I've discovered some things about Bo, because I keep working 12 steps, and I keep talking to my sponsor and reading all these weirdo spiritual books. And there are some really neat, cool, weirdo things going on in the world today. There really are. I mean, it almost seems like when you got a real piece of shit like the fucking Iraqi war, you've also got some really beautiful, divine, you know, godly things going on. I don't know why that is. But, uh, you know, I was very much uh, part of the hippie movement. And, uh, and at the time, I remember wondering, like, gee, you know, like, I sure hope I'm on the right side with all this. I mean, I kind of felt like I was. But that was simply based on a very simple thing because, you know, from my observation, what the war in Vietnam was about was killing uh, people with yellow skin on the other side of the planet. And that benefited the uh, economy of the United States, and that made it okay. And they did a lot of, lot of business, you know, uh, with the government. And uh, they would even make, uh, like, jellied gasoline that you could spray from aircraft onto villagers. And they would just melt away. Men, women, children, you know, little babies. Well, it's war. An absolute bullshit, hateful damn thing. One of the things that I learned as an adult member of the human race, born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, was there was no help on the face of the planet Earth for drug addicts. And since my girlfriend had just died of overdose in California, and I had gotten crazy mean on Crystal and ran her ass off, so I'm not even sure what city she died in, uh, I just went from being on top of the world one day to under the sidewalk the next. And I sort of stumbled around from then, which was like my early 20s, uh, till I got clean in Narcotics Anonymous at, when I was 29 years old. And what I did first, outside of being like disabled enough to where I couldn't really talk, and uh, I would forget what I was saying in the middle of a sentence, even on TV, and uh, I did that. And... Uh, I said, see, there I go. There's an example. <laughs> but anyway, 
<laughs> didn't, didn't quite, you know, kill the pain, but a little less embarrassing. And uh, so anyway, uh, so like praying, you know, before uh, sharing today and uh, I remember I spoke at the first East Coast Convention in uh, Harrisburg, uh, no, in Allentown. No, the first was in Lewisburg up the river from that nuke plant that down there blew up. Remember that? Yeah, in fact, it was a few weeks later. <laughs> so we were all driving by like this. <laughs> but uh, I remember using the word channel in my talk, and that had not become like popular, like New Age channeling and all. But I suspect that sometimes I channel. So if I talk a little weird, that's what's going on. It may not even be me talking. Uh, it might be the Spirit talking through me. And uh, one thing, yes, yeah, somebody, keep it going. Yeah, you say that now. Uh, but uh, one of my pet theories, and I'm like any addict worth the salt, I've got a lot of theories, and one of my theories about children is that a little small child, where are the little small children here? A little small child is aware that their parents are afraid of things. And it's subtle, but as they grow up, they notice. And then when they get in their teens, they go to find out what mom and daddy are afraid of. So you've got to watch that transference if you really want to love your children. Because what you're afraid of, that you're pretty big to them. And if you're afraid of it, they've going, they're going to, got to find out, right? You get my drift, right? And... Uh, and so there's like the spoken program of Narcotics Anonymous and the unspoken program of Narcotics Anonymous. When I got clean, there were no meetings in Georgia. I had run a nonprofit on the strip for about a year and a half. It got so rough after the first year when the sun went down, I would just nonchalantly like go find my six shooter and strap it on. If I went out, I had a loaded gun. And that was just so nobody would bother me because I was like that well-known and on TV a lot and all that shit. And in those days, and the thing is that those two years taught me, it was an anti-drug anti type activity. I would take kids down to Grady and get their abscesses lanced, get them a, a Grady card and walk them past the police and get them out. And uh, so they trusted me, you know. And, uh, and I was very devoted. But I felt so shitty about the hippie movement going bad because we were absolutely college kids and sincere. And I've been gassed in D.C. I've been like pepper gassed in the, in, uh, on, you know, along the mall there. Uh, it's, I can tell many stories. I'm not going to diverge. But uh, by the time I got to narcotics, I studied spirituality. I'd gone to theosophy, uh, which is an interesting subject you can google it on the net but uh you study like real spiritual stuff buddha hinduism spiritual principles a lot of that stuff so i knew a lot and one thing about hippies boy we could sure ass talk we could talk make love and do back rubs and march but uh you know the other thing but uh but anyway, so it was kind of a continuation of that for me to like just stop working and stop and you know, and I had gotten too weird to go to college, and uh, and the two years on the strip was was good because it helped people. You know, it may be one of the things that helped keep me alive to get here. You know, because uh, God was around before NA started spreading. But after two years on the strip, I could appreciate what a miracle Narcotics Anonymous was because I'd gone looking for it and there wasn't any. Not in Georgia, not in the South. There were scattering of meetings around Wilkes-Barre and Scranton and Los Angeles. Period. 1970, there were 20 meetings in the whole world. Known. 20 known meetings. That counted Pennsylvania. Three or four meetings up there. 
And if you don't think that's scary, you better just get off somewhere and sit down quietly, get with your God and think about that shit. And, uh, you know, just, uh, I'm thinking 45 minutes. Now, you can talk for two or three weeks. You know you can. Don't diverge. Try to stay on the theme, okay? So I'm exerting my effort. This is with God's help to stay on track. Because y'all, well, y'all need to know some stuff, okay? One thing, one or two things about this member of Narcotic Sonomas that I found out in my clean time that I did not know, suspect to have any damn idea of, is I have one hell of a lot of royal blood. I've got seven lines of descent from William the Conqueror. And William uh, was a very great king in England because he's credited with making England British, okay? And I asked my buddy, that's a genealogist, he's a professional genealogist, and I'm his sponsor. And um, I said, well, what was so cool about him? I mean, you know, like you can get to be a king just by having a lot of guns and you're born right. And you just, you know, apply the pressure. You just, you know, badass MF. But, but he said, uh, no, King William was a great king. And so I read a couple of things on the net about him. And two things about King William. He left behind him the... Uh, It's a, prop, it's a basis for property title. The Book of Dunes or something like that. And 87 castles. So before William, if you were industrious, like a, a, a warlord or a peasant or whatever, and built yourself up, the neighboring warlord would let you build up and watch you, just like you watch an apple ripen on the tree, and when they're ready, they come pick you. So you, whoever you could not build anything up because there was no law of the land or king to take your side in things. There was no order. You getting a picture? Okay, so I feel honored to have that kind of heritage and blood and stuff. It also answers a big question for me, like why am I a little bit different, okay? Not everybody you run into helped write the basic text of Narcotics Anonymous. When we found out there was nobody anywhere working on it, we were absolutely shocked and surprised and confused. We could not imagine that there was not anybody anywhere working on it. Let that sink in. And I went to uh, San Francisco. To, I got clean in 74. I went to San Francisco in 77 to the World Convention. I had sort of glimmered that I might really like this thing called N.A. in the first little while. And then I had a sinking feeling because I felt like I would get the benefits of recovery without working a price, which is work, surrender, work, coming to believe, turn your life and your will over, work in the 12 steps of N.A. So I was very ardent about working that. And what motivated me, because I certainly didn't have any great direction, there was nobody there. It was just all of us newcomers that happened to cling to one another enough to stay clean. But we helped each other. And if you were a real sincere man or woman newcomer, you asked me a damn hard question. I got clean on finding your answers. I didn't have your answers usually, but I could find your answers. And very, you know how addicts are once they get honed in on something? Uh, I could develop your answer at, it quickly. I knew more and more people who had answers. I could dial phone numbers on the West Coast, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, so that was three years. Also, another phenomenon, I'd gone to a meeting a day since I had first started going to meetings, of course, another program, and there was one meeting a day. It was 110 meetings the first 90 days. Uh, they made me coffee chair this terrific uh, Saturday night AA group. And... Uh, a month at, later, they started the first meeting uh, that lasted. I had started one several years earlier, but, um, you know, we had no literature, no contact with clean acts. It just didn't work out. So uh, I just went to meetings, uh, and uh, after a month, I went to this announced first meeting in the NA, you know, since you know, in the recent, in that time frame. I didn't want to go. I felt like it wouldn't work. I went anyway. And what I noticed over the next few weeks at this NA meeting was the newcomers were like blinking their way out of the fog the first week. After a couple of weeks, they're popping their fingers. After three or four weeks, they 
realize I've got to learn this program slang and terminology to get the hell out of here. You know, I guess we got to the using, right? But, uh, but still, you can see them kind of waking up and getting more mobile and stuff like that. And uh, that wakened something in my heart. That made me interested because, you know, everybody hears about recovery. Well, now you get to experience it, but back then you only heard about it as some kind of vague, you know, maybe there's something going into Tibet or, you know, Germany because, uh, you know, wherever it is, it ain't here. And, uh, and so the idea of building up our own, for one thing, from the very beginning, and this is with no instruction and no clean time sponsor or anything else. I had this really nice guy with 20 years in AA, but he was uh, not an addict. <laughs> and uh, I'll give you some idea. And uh, so I pretty much, I stuck with addicts. And they'd all seen me on TV a lot, and I didn't realize that, but that was what, one of the things. And uh, after two years, they said, what have you done for your people? And I said, my people, what are you talking about? But, of course, you know, I put it together. I mean, I would go to AA meetings, but I would say, my name's Bo, and I'm a speed freak, or my name's Bo, and I'm an acid head. And there are a lot of people don't like you to go to those AA meetings if you're a speed freak or acid head. <laughs> and they'll tell you all about it, everything you want to hear. But, uh, so... Basically, what happened was I show up in San Francisco, and this guy, um, Jimmy Kennan, says, Hey, Greg, here's this guy from Georgia asking about the book. Why don't you go talk to him about the book? Well, Greg's the chairman of the board of trustees. Jimmy is Jimmy Kennan, the, you know, your friend of the Jim McKay guy. And uh, so me and Greg go off, and we talk, become friends. I go up to his room. We become better friends, meet his wife go down to L.A. with him the next week. I'm asking about the book, you know, and wondering about, you know, all kind of questions about N.A. And uh, but basically what he says, any addict, any member of N.A. can write this stuff. I said, why is it that no one has? And he didn't have a good answer. Uh but he gave me plenty of personal encouragement. And his, I'd been to his home and knew his family, his wife and kids. And uh, been, you know, took me by WSO and some of the oldest NA meetings in the world. So when I got back to Georgia, uh, I told my wife about it. And I sat down on Saturday and I'd get about five pages on it. I was praying to be used as an instrument and I was writing on whatever you would say or expect to hear at a good NA meeting. And uh, so the topic says, resentment's killed. Now write about it. So I get about five pages on a Saturday, right? When I got up to 40 pages, I went down to Zares and brought a little $50 blue plastic portable typewriter. It had a letter line like this. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I built up about 100 pages or so. And I kept sending them out to Greg, sending them out to Greg. He'd show them to Jimmy, Chuck Skinner, all the other people out there. And... Uh, after he, Greg trained me, he sort of uh, mentored me for world services, and I had a, a, a healthy habit or two for administrating on the strip, that nonprofit group. Uh, and so I was, it wasn't a ploy, it was not like some kind of clever tactic, like tricking someone, but when I decided something would be good or might ought to be done, I would contact Greg and Jimmy and all of them, run it by them. So by the time I actually did it, it had so impact because when you're dealing with people two or 3,000 miles away that don't know you real good, you don't want to leave a lot of stuff to their imagination. So, yeah, and we did a monthly letter and this and that and the other. I wrote a letter. Uh, Jimmy asked me to write a letter to the uh, Worldwide Fellowship about why we need a book now. And somebody later told me that one of the clever lines in the letter that wasn't meant to be clever, but it was most people uh, don't uh, do anything about the book because they just, they, uh, they're just they afraid or they just don't know the need, something like that. It was like a veiled insult. But it was a little bit of what writers call a hook because they got pissed off enough to write something. So anyway, between one thing and many others, I got elected World Lit Chair because I was the only one addict that had written anything. Well, I don't know that more than a handful of people read what I had written. 
I don't know if it was that good. But it was writing, it was from an addict, and that was good enough to get you elected World Lit Chair. So, so I chaired the Lit Committee for two years, and we now had a service structure that Greg wrote between uh, 73 and 75, and the Board of Trustees okayed, rubber stamp, and uh, old Chuck, old crusty Chuck, he says, well, it's kind of like wordy, but I guess it's okay. But it, it allowed for a representative, democratic service structure that everybody in the Worldwide Fellowship could be a part of. If you were a member, you had a say. You could write a note to your ASR, GSR, RSR, or to the World Service Conference, or the Board of Trustees, or straight to WSO, and get an acknowledgement. Get back a real letter answering your question, even if the answer is, we don't know. But that created a world, it empowered people, it gave them information, it gave them contact, it made it a big deal to be a member of something. Okay, and one of the somethings was that we had now a lit committee, which, a, which was a non-ego trip way to have a book, because we can now generate literature, and I was the chair, and I was praying, and I, I thought to myself, when I got elected world lit chair, I saw the planet spread at my feet for about two days. <laughs> I'm gonna, you can't see this on the tape or CD, but like I'm smiling and looking to side to side. Just, oh, wow. And then it dawned on me from my administration experience on the strip how shitty it was going to feel to let a year, year go by and I don't do nothing. You can't understand how that hit me? So that kept jabbing me in the ass every time I slowed down all year. And we did, we did wonders for the lit movement. Uh... And this is not a workshop, I'm just a member sharing, but this is my story, of course. And so I'm going to skip forward a lot. But we did a booklet, we did a handbook for NA Lit Committees, which is a very important archival piece. If you're ever lucky enough to find one or find one on the web, download it and print it out. Because that was the beginning of it all. Because it was an organized plan. It grew out of the Wichita Lit Conference. So we had a bunch of, 25 members came in. And they talked and shared, did workshop on topics like what to write, how to form a lit committee, how to raise money within traditions, and uh, how to do a local newsletter, and how to form a committee. I mean, all the basic stuff. So we gave them the nuts and bolts, and that fellowship responded by doing what they were recommended to do. And they formed lit committees all over. And I would put a pen on a little board every time there was a, a lit committee. I would write down the chairperson's name and issue an edict of making them a co-chair of World Lit. So I'd come out with a monthly letter, and if they hadn't called me, I'd call them. So I welded the whole damn system together, because we had a lit chair in L.A., a lit chair in San Francisco, and Pennsylvania, and Houston, Atlanta, Miami, just every damn where. And uh, if you didn't call me, I'd call you. I had a checklist, your name, your phone number, and the last time you called. Like, there's nine months left and four lines per, and then you make a check mark. If you call me, if you haven't called me, I know it, I'll call you. And, uh, and then they, when they, I would read the letter to them, and they would, I would say, how does that sound? They'd say, well, you left out so-and-so. And I'd say, let me write that down. I'd write down your words, put in the letter in your words carefully. And when you saw your words in the monthly letter, then I had you. And all I had to do after that was keep faith with you, which I was very happy and delighted to do. And I was comfortable doing it, and I became better and better at doing it. Because I realized if I please you and you and you and you, you would write the fucking book. And we would all be better off. Okay? And, and I've studied Machiavelli. I've studied Miles Sagtoon. I, I know uh, what Genghis Khan did, etc. You know? And this is war, goddammit. They will kill us. We are expendable. Everybody in this room and everybody in the Worldwide Fellowship, if we died today, the government would just go like, tiss, tiss, poor guys, too bad. And think about all the money they're going to save on arresting us, treating us, jailing us, making more drugs for us, all the ammunition they need to deal with us, and all the damn equipment DA needs to have to break into your house and take your children's uh, college fund. It's a rigged game. 
The only way we can fight back is stand up and fucking communicate and get real about some of this stuff and, and find out what we can do to help. And you know, the main thing you can do to help is stay clean today and stay on the phone one more minute with that poor son of a bitch she called you asking for help but not expecting much. Because that's where the miracles comes from. Every stove has got a kitchen. Every kitchen has, has got a little place that gets hot on top of the stove. That's, this is, that's how we do it. Because you cannot help anybody. It's God helps somebody through you. And when that energy passes through you, you are like magnetized. I told you I was going to talk weird, right? Okay, one of the things I've collected, these like two little bitty magnets that are like one by two by a quarter of an inch. And I put them on a refrigerator door. And I've been fascinated with this for some time now because like one way you can call God is the unseen. God is the unseen. God is the invisible. Whoo, must be a lot of God. And uh, I mean, think about light. You know that light's energy, right? I mean, it'll make a sunburn. It will like, you know, it can cook things. You can like put in a reflector and cook a hamburger. Uh, how much energy is in this light? It is coming from everywhere. And we have these marvelous little hookups in our faces that let us pick up on the light. And we can like imagine that there's a, uh, what do you call those damn things? A chandelier there and a tree and a kid. Uh, but that's energy, man. There's a lot of energy. Okay, the magnets are invisible. They've got, there's nothing there. I got two of them, north and south pole or north and north. And you push it, I can push that magnet off the refrigerator with the other magnet and not even come closer than a quarter of an inch. So a lot of spirituality is, is coming to terms with and learn to deal with the unseen. Well, there's a war on this planet and nobody really started it. It's not anybody's fault. You don't have to hate anybody, but just be hip to it between the worldly and the spiritual. There's something called the uh, Monday morning effect. You have a great spiritual gathering. And then Monday morning, you go like, oh, that must have been a dream. I got to get back to the real world now and do my job and work. Get up and go make that boss happy. Okay. But really, life comes from the spiritual. Babies come from making love the spiritual. The things we do in bed to one another come from the spiritual. They presage taking care of little children in all the ways little children need to be taken care of, etc. Okay, so getting clean and staying clean. Don't use and keep coming back. Well, yeah, that's pretty good. But what we mean by that is you're going to be around people that are magnetized, people that are spiritualized. Oh, the magnet thing. You can take a pocket knife. See my pocket knife? The, the visible pocket knife is in Jacksonville because they don't let you on planes with them now. <laughs> but you can take a pocket knife that doesn't, will not pick up iron filings and rub it against a powerful magnet. I'm going to do this someday while I'm talking. I'll just like get me a magnet and do all that. And everybody will say, good Lord, where did this guy come from? And, uh, but after a short time, the knife will start picking up iron filings. Something invisible happens inside of steel. Is steel kind of regarded as a hard, durable form of matter? And this invisible nothing is strong enough. So when you keep coming back, you keep your magnetism going. You know, when they give out chips and all that, and this one glows in the dark. I don't know why, but I've been to 10,000 meetings. I've never heard anybody say, well, yeah, it glows in the dark, but... You, you, hey, you got to put it up by a light bulb first so it'll, you know, like get the energy. You keep coming back so you keep getting the energy and you keep glowing in the dark. And as these creeps up on you, it sees that light and it, goes, it just runs off. So uh, a lot of the, uh, one of the topics in the uh, Handbook VNA Lit Committees was paperwork talking about if you receive a request, if your committee receives a request for information or input on a given subject, realize that the system will not function if you do not write that response down and mail it to us. We're just kidding ourselves. There's not going to be a book. 
So we had about 15 or 18 lit committees, I think, before it was all said and done. So they would do work like, let me give you, what I'm doing is I am trying to be their witness. I was their chairperson for two years. And they would start working on input on a Friday night and stay up till 3 in the morning writing and editing and generating original material. And they would get up Saturday about 20 or 30 in a big farmhouse and write all day Saturday, wait until the wee hours. And when they weren't finished on Sunday, they would do it again next weekend. The Memphis Literature Conference started on a Saturday and ran... Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, a nine-day lit conference. A hundred people showed up and worked 20 hours a day. That's 2,000 hours a day for a week. That's where your book came from. I was their chairperson. The fellowship wrote the book. We helped. Okay, that's the whole deal right there. And we saw miracles. I mean, every day was like a week. You can't believe how much work got done. I remember one one uh, moment that kind of it was kind of humorous, but but then again, think about it. Uh, I told this group of about ten or eleven uh, members. I said, "Well, they got some input on so and so. This chapter up in Philadelphia, they're going to uh, FedEx it down here. It should be here tomorrow afternoon." Everybody got real quiet. I said, unless y'all can think of something better. And somebody says, <clears throat> well, they could take it out to the airport and put it on an airplane like a human being here. It'd be in a couple of hours. So said, that's it. That's what we're going to do. That's what we did. And it was there in a couple of hours. And that's where they work. Uh, chapter 6 in the basic text that most of you have read. Molly typed it. Greg wrote it and read into a telephone from Wolf Creek because he would have to go down the mountain into the valley and cross into California and drive over to San Francisco, and then could he, he could mail it to us. Otherwise, it would be next week when we got it. So I sat behind Molly, and she was like a, a typewriter, and I could still see her hands and these big, long, purple fingernails, and I could hear old Greg going, blah, 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 blah. I could hear that. I was holding the phone to her ear. Thumb up the back of the neck and squeeze a little bit if you want more pressure. Push away a little bit if less pressure. And uh, I could see the sixth chapter coming out. He would go, blah, 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 and she would go. <laughs> she was really fast. She just kept on, too. It didn't stop. And you could see that old sixth chapter just rolling out on the spindle. And then a page you get done, lay it on the table. Another page. Just keep going. So, and uh, then I didn't know how long we'd been doing it, and I looked up, and I knew it was uh, around 11 when we started, and it was 4 in the morning when we stopped. So I don't know how, try standing there for damn five hours, you know. But, see, this, this is World Lit Committee. This is Narcotics Anonymous. And those people that wrote your basic text went home and started 20,000 meetings. And you have to tell them nothing about N.A. They knew about N.A. because they wrote the book on N.A. And we helped them do it. Okay, so that's, does that break a mystery? Does everybody get that? Any questions on that one? <laughs> And uh, when we would hit brick walls, we would not lie to our people. We would say, we hit a brick wall, so-and-so happened. It didn't matter whether it was good news or bad news. I knew the only way to keep you was to be honest and real with you. You can take the damn truth. You cannot take a lie. Because a lie will, like, trigger that dopatic imagination, and that son of a bitch can <laughs> tear your head off. And... Uh, and there were like, you know, there were like prices to be paid. Like one of the things uh, was that I was married. I had a couple of kids. My life went to hell. My business went to hell. My marriage went to hell. I lost the business, lost the kids, lost the wife. Well, we got the book done. Are you glad? Yes. Did I do the right thing? Yes. It was hard, let me tell you. And I still have people that think I don't have good sense because I spend all of my time working for you. 
and we put out books uh, at cost, and we work outside the structure because the structure today wants to control, and it's a creative process. We must be free to write quality recovery material. And with our background experience and these huge damn computers you can get nowadays and worldwide internet, NA net, does anybody get that joke? NA net? Uh, if any of y'all have Netflix, then uh, order a copy of OS Revolution because the men and women that built the internet as a free uh, worldwide web are the most important heroes in your times. And the establishment won't let you know their names. Does anybody, know, anybody here know one single name of somebody that built the World Wide Web? Get my drift? Get my drift? They are the biggest heroes on the planet. If you want to bomb Taiwan today, they won't let you. You know why? Because they're bookkeepers in Taiwan. You ain't bombing my bookkeeper. I have five minutes left. Is this a joke or what? <laughs> uh, so needless to say, I survived. I got the kids back and uh, raised them mostly as a single parent. Uh, I feel like uh, I'm continuing to work on my steps. And I'm working more, I think, on step 11 and meditation. There's some forms of meditation that might be worth checking out someday. And I don't recommend them if you're not on your 11th step because uh, the speaker at San Francisco, uh, Frank D. from Venice Beach, I'll never forget it. He says, uh, if you try to work your 11th step before you work the preceding 10, you will go insane. Why? Because you get a lot of power from the 11th step. And if you still have your disbelief, lack of surrender, inability to turn your life and will over care of God, character defects and unmade amends intact, and the inability to make amends, then you don't need no more power, let me tell you what. <laughs> I mean, that's just like letting your little kid play in traffic, you know, with your car. Uh, it's not smart. But then, see, one of the things we have to get good at in Narcotics Anonymous is keep telling our newcomers and our general fellowship what discoveries are made, okay? Because one thing I learned, I didn't finish college because I had a drug problem, but before I dropped out, uh, Socrates said the population that is starved of its technological advancement becomes starved philosophically, if you're not aware of your technology, you will become stars philosophically. You run a narcotic synonymous. This is the top of the mountain. It ain't in California. It ain't in New York or New Orleans. It's right here. Wherever you're at, your home group. If it ain't happening there, it ain't happening. And I'll tell you another thing, because some of you travel a long ways to be here. Some of you know this, but I doubt very many of you know this. If you travel everywhere, if you just diligently go to meetings in a lot of differently, different geographically separated locations, you'll hear a member in Texas complaining the same way a member in Connecticut does. Everybody thinks they're the only one and nobody else is going through this shit. Now, we used to know everything. If somebody dropped a paperclip at WSO, we knew. And we don't know much anymore. The blessing there, I compare it to a situation like WSO is up in a hot air balloon. They got our money, our copyrights, our checkbook, and they're floating off. And they think they're knowledgeable because you can see a lot from one of those damn things, right? When you're up in the air, hot air balloon. But you ain't got your feet on the ground. You can't do nothing about it. And I'd rather be here with my feet on the ground than up there with the paycheck and the copyrights and the hot air balloon. And God's got some plans for you. You got some miracles waiting on you. Are you going to be there when the mail arrives? Or did you make the prayer and, stay, and then you were out of town the day the mail came? And some prayers take longer to answer. I mean, hell. You know, the most important thing about the basic text production is we use spiritual principles. And the spiritual principles got results. We were told you'll never get addicts to agree on everything. That sounds right. That's wrong. That's a lie. 
Now, that's a little bit of a long, drawn-out deal, but I mean, there's so, only so many things you can write down about the four-step inventory before you start repeating yourself. There's, I mean, there's, all, you know, staying clean in illness. There's all, in all honesty, there's only a certain number. Of th you tell your sponsor, tell your home group, don't lie to your doctor. And realize it's your ass is the grass if, if you get loaded. <laughs> you know, and... Uh, but the process of running it by 10,000 people is healthy. That's very good for the fellowship because you become enriched in the process. And, and when you are privy to that kind of uh, participation, we call it open participatory writing, then you are enriched in a way that just stays with you forever. And you feel like this electricity, you just feel like you vibrate, you're just coming alive. Maybe that's that magnetism. But anyway, keep studying and share what you learn. Borrow from any field of human wisdom and endeavor to enrich our fellowship. That's what we did. Don't ever shut the doors and, and go back to fear-based living because it's all about faith-based living. Thank you. It's good to be here. <laughs>